Welcome everyone to our On Things Come webinar. Uh, today at a different time, it's 9 a.m. here in Beijing, it's 9 p.m. Uh, there in the U.S. We have Professor Robert, Robert Pappalardo, um, based in the U.S., who today will talk about the NASA Europa Clipper mission, the uh, NASA mission to Jupiter's moon Europa. Many thanks to Professor Pappalardo for accepting our invitation, and you can see him in the webcam. And you can see in the webcam also the EC Beijing Executive Director, Professor Wing Wen Yip from Taiwan. I am Laura, I'm based in Beijing. And before we can start, I can give you a very brief uh, introduction to EC Beijing, so the International Space Science Institute Beijing, for those who are not familiar with it. If you have watched our previous webinars, you probably know it by heart by now. EC Beijing, the International Space Science Institute Beijing, as I said, was uh, established in 2013 thanks to the cooperation between the International Space Science Institute in Bern, Switzerland, that was founded in uh, 1995, and the National Space Science Center of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Since then, uh, our cooperation has gotten stronger and stronger. We organize some events together, some other events uh, uh, are only here at EC Beijing, uh, but the main goal is always the same, that is to advise space science studies. So we try to cover a wide array of uh, um, disciplines in space science and we do that through a wide array of events including workshops, forums, international teams, we have working groups, uh, um, we have visiting scientists, discipline scientists and so on. Uh, right now because of the global situation we don't have any offline events but we have uh, kicked off this uh, webinar series last year in September that is dedicated to ongoing and future space. Lola? Master. Uh, Lola? Just wait a minute. Come back. Huh. Okay. Um, in that case, let me let me let me continue. You know, um, are you ready, uh, Bob? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would like to say a few words uh, uh, introducing you to the audience. Um, so today we have a uh, uh, professor um, Bob Balado uh, from JPL uh, to to give the talk on the on on the NASA's Europa Clip permission. And uh, I just want to say a few words about about uh, Bob's um, education. And he 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 grew up in New York, uh, from what I read. And uh, he might still be speaking with a New Yorker, you know, accent. And um, the uh, his undergrad was in uh, from Cornell. Um, the, and I think he was attracted to painted sons by 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 Professor Car Car Sagan, right? Um, yes. And then I mean, the, if you read his. Uh, <laughs> If you go to Wikipedia reading, uh, uh, his, uh, you know, his CV is like a who's who, who's who, you know, <laughs> in his education. And he went to, uh, went to Arizona State, um, working with, uh, Professor Ron Guerrilli, uh, yeah. And his PhD thesis on, on the, on Miranda, on the, on the Voyager uh, imaging results of Miranda. And then he went to, that's when I met him, I think, first time. And you, you were postdoc with, uh, with, uh, Jim Head, right, in, in Brown. That's, that's where I saw you uh, with the Galileo, the Galileo mission, and um, and then he he got a job, you know, in Colorado. We were very all very impressed. You know, good grief, you know, Bob <laughs> become a professor, <laughs> and then for a few years he he went to JPL, <laughs> um, and uh, for course uh, for for greater things, you know, for much greater things, I think, yeah, and uh, we know now why, you know. And that the, I think that he's he's the cornerstone of the of the Europa Clip mission, uh, and I, I think he's, he's <laughs> I think we owe him a lot um, on this mission. But I, I should say that you know if the audience in the in uh, from in 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 China uh, a Chinese scientists, uh, I would say that the later you see that from Bob's uh, 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 description, uh, NASA's I think NASA's biggest uh, biggest uh, invention is a supported scientist. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> I mean, he, he put uh, they put everything together, right, and, they, 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 and get the mission going. 
and uh, and uh, and I mean, you look at his uh, Bob's um, hobby, you know, he thinks that being a, uh, a positive scientist is not enough. During those are very complicated, you know, uh, theory and and management. He, his hobby is to to have a even more complicated thing like dancing. You know. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Bob, uh, I would like to hear your dancing. You know, if the, if the European Group permission, thank you. Thank, thank you, Wayne. Uh, you know, there hasn't been a lot given given all that's been going on lately, but I'm looking forward to picking up on it again. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here, even if uh, uh, remotely, and, and see you again, again Wing. Uh, we go way, way back, as, as, as he mentioned, back to the Galileo days. And, and Galileo is really the cornerstone of some of what I'll be talking about just at the beginning of the talk here, which tells us uh, essentially, uh, well, most of what we know about Europa. Um, that we understand today and, and helps lay the groundwork for what we can do with the Europa Clipper mission. I'll talk just a little bit about Europa science just as a background and most of the presentation will be about uh, the mission itself and what we're trying to find uh, at Europa and how. So the Galilean satellites of Jupiter, of course, uh, 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 we first understood what they were from Galileo Galilei's observations over 400 years ago, and the spacecraft named for him uh, made um, about a dozen close passes of Europa during its time in the Jupiter system. There was uh, an encounter with one of the Galilean satellites for each Galileo orbit. The Europa Clipper will do something similar. It will orbit Jupiter and make a close flyby of Europa. Most times there will be the occasional flyby of Ganymede or Callisto in order to shape and change the orbit in order to cover Europa as uniformly uh, from, from various directions as we can do, as you'll see. So we know Io is the rocky object of this set, Ganymede and Callisto are about half ice and half rock, and uh, Europa is really a rocky moon with uh, an H2O skin, a skin of ice probably above liquid water. So if we look at Europa's surface from Galileo, it's very different from other planetary surfaces. You can find some analogies, some analogs, on Earth, on Mars, maybe on Pluto, maybe on Triton, uh, Enceladus, uh, but um, but really the, the bizarre set of features on Europa is pretty unique. Uh, on the left you can see Europa globally. There are bright regions that um, when we see close up look like these ridged plains that are cross-cut by generations of ridges and grooves and commonly these ridges cut the surface in pairs they form together and even though they're one of the most common landforms on Europa we don't really understand how they form it might be from strike slip motion along them heating them causing the, the ice uh, along a fracture to heat and rise up that's one um, possible model uh, there are also the, the there's also the model terrain, the dark reddish areas of Europa. Uh, most of it consists of chaotic terrain, places where the surface has broken up. It probably looked like the ridge plains. It's broken up into these plates and this hummocky matrix material, probably from some sort of heat source below. And a popular model is that there could possibly be liquid water down there that was involved in the formation and maybe in some places uh, still existing today uh, in in the ice shell uh, and above the liquid water ocean that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there are also these little spots, lenticulae or freckles uh, that pepper Europa's surface and may be transitional to the chaos terrain, uh, a little hard to make out in the global view. And there are relatively few large impact craters. 
You can see uh, one pictured at the lower right here, Pwil, uh, or really Pwch if you're Welsh. And here it is, it's about 20 or so kilometers across. There are all other, there are only two other uh, larger structures that we know of that are multi-ring basins that may have formed when uh, an impactor penetrated all the way through Europa's icy surface. Uh, Pwil's uh, ejecta has gone a thousand kilometers across the surface and and some of these little craters within Konamara chaos here are thought to be secondaries from, from this impact, which uh, probably formed within the last four million years or so, because that's how often uh, a crater on the scale of 20 kilometers should form on Europa. So we can count up the few large craters and get an estimate of the age of the surface, and that's uh, something like 60 million years uh, on average with a uncertainty of about a factor of three. So of course we want to know how these features formed, um, how they're related to uh, the possibility of liquid water. Whoops, and my screen has frozen. So let's see if I can fix that. Uh, just a moment. No problem. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, on the left, you see um, a, a figure that represents what we think we know about the interior of Europa based on gravity data from Galileo, the 12 or so close passes. Uh, from Doppler gravity, we can get an idea of the interior structure, how centrally concentrated material is based on the axial moment of inertia of the moon. So if you assume a three-layer moon, with an iron core, a rocky mantle, and an H2O layer, water and or ice, uh, then these are the, the approximate thicknesses that result, about 100 kilometers of uh, H2O. And from, so from the gravity data, we have an idea of the total thickness, about 100 kilometers, and from geologic evidence, especially those multi-ring impacts that might have penetrated, the two of them that might have penetrated through Europa's ice shell, uh, there's an estimate of about 20 kilometers for the ice shell thickness. One can also uh, calculate what might be the average thickness of the ice shell based on tidal heating, and that comes out to be about 20, 25 uh, kilometers. Um, tidal heating, of course, is uh, uh, results from the fact that Europa's orbit is not circular but elliptical, so it's getting a little closer and a little farther from Jupiter as it orbits, and when it's a little closer, it gets stretched out more by Jupiter's gravity, as illustrated, not to scale on the right, and um, when it's a little farther, it contracts. And it also uh, librates relative to Jupiter, facing the empty focus of the orbit. So if you're in Europa's perspective, as in this video, it seems to be nodding back and forth. So the radial tide and the librational tide combine to generate heat uh, in the interior of Europa, at least in the ice shell and possibly in the silicate mantle. In fact, a recent paper by Berenkova uh, suggests that there could be a lot of a lot of tidal heating down in that rocky mantle, which can be important for habitability because if there's uh, activity down there in the mantle, then that's a good source of reductance into Europa's ocean, or even just contact of water with rock. Uh, uh, formation of serpentine releases hydrogen, uh, also reducing reaction. Uh, as far uh, there could be, there almost certainly will be oxidants on the surface of Europa. In fact, we know from Galileo that there are, because radiation from Jupiter's magnetosphere is hitting the surface of Europa, tearing apart H2O molecules. Uh, the hydrogen floats away, some of the oxygen is left behind, um, and uh, forms things like peroxides, formaldehyde. And if those can get into the ocean, that's a source of oxidants to potentially power life within Europa's ocean. So understanding the level of activity at Europa um, uh, and 
how material can get from the surface into the interior is very important in understanding Europa's potential habitability. So I mentioned the magnetosphere. Uh, on the left is an artist's um, uh, illustration of Europa orbiting uh, Jupiter in its magnetospheric environment there. And on the right is um, a model made by Corey Cochran of JPL to illustrate Europa's induced magnetic field as it orbits around Jupiter. Because uh, Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted about 10 degrees relative to um, its rotational axis, as Europa is orbiting around, it finds itself alternating above and below the, the magnetic equator of Jupiter. And so the, the um, magnetic vector that's being seen at Europa, you can see that green line swinging back and forth as Europa finds itself alternatingly above and below uh, the magnetic equator of Jupiter. And um, so this means from Europa's perspective, it's feeling a magnetic field that is changing uh, with a period of five and a half hours as related to the uh, synodic period of Europa around Jupiter. Um, Europa also has, uh, as you mentioned, an elliptical orbit. So there's another component that's changing with an 85 hour period, the period of Europa's orbit around Jupiter. Those are the frequencies of induction that we want to measure with the Europa Clippers magnetometer. Now the Galileo spacecraft was able to measure um, and find for the first time that that uh, 11 hour period, the synodic period of uh, Europa around Jupiter. And, and the fact that Europa has, um, seems to have a magnetic field of its own, but that magnetic field changes depending on where Europa is relative to the magnetic equator, that tells us that Europa is behaving as a conductor. Its interior, its shallow interior, is behaving as a conductor. And that's the best evidence that we have for an ocean within Europa today. So we want to redo that experiment with Europa Clipper, but instead of a dozen flybys, we're going to have about 50 flybys with a much more precise instrument uh, that can get at the multiple frequencies of magnetic induction. Oh, in fact, I thought I had a little illustration. There it is. Uh, let's see, I won't go into too much detail here because the plot's a bit complicated, but um, what we can measure those two frequencies of induction, the 11 hour and the 85 hour, and the uh, Predicted curves are here, model curves are here, depending, so depending on what we measure for that eight and a half hour period and for the 11 hour period, where those curves cross, we'll be able to constrain not just that Europa has an ocean, as we know today, the product of conductivity and ocean thickness, but um, we should be able to separate, separate out the ocean thickness or depth um, from the conductivity and uniquely characterize each with um, the more precise measurements from Europa Clipper. So um, I skipped a little ahead in terms of what we're, we're doing with the mission, but again, some background here of what makes Europa such a fascinating place. We think Europa probably has the so-called ingredients for life, water, the right chemistry, um, from which organic molecules can be built and the chemical energy that might sustain life. So water in terms of liquid water ocean and the fact that there might be lakes within the ice shell below chaos regions, and we can test for that. From local melting, um, uh, diapirs that might warm to the melting point, for example. Uh, the chemistry of Europa's ocean and surface is probably affected by leaching of rock into liquid water and that material in ways that we're not yet sure of uh, seems to be injected into the ice shell and sometimes make its way to the surface based on on dark spots and, and areas that 
suggest um, uh, extrusion, volcanism of watery material. Uh, chemical energy is actually the hard one. I mentioned that uh, before, that, that oxidants are produced at surface, reductants uh, down at the mantle floor, probably. And uh, if, it's, if those oxidants have a geological path through the ice shell, and if the interior, especially if the interior is tightly heated, the rocky core, then um, that would signal that Europa would be a very, Europa's ocean would, could be a very um, attractive place to search for life in the more distant future, say with a lander at Europa. So the Europa Clipper mission will test key hypotheses uh, related to finding the ingredients for life at Europa. So that leads to the goal and objectives of the mission. We want to explore Europa to investigate its habitability. And we're going to do so by examining its ice shell and ocean, understanding the ice shell, where is there subsurface water, confirming an ocean um, uh, through multiple techniques, understanding if the ice shell is heterogeneous, understand the ocean properties such as salinity, and, and the nature of surface ice ocean exchange. How can material get from the surface down into the ocean, including oxidants, and does material from the ocean get to the surface, and how, where we can explore it with remote sensing and, again, someday potentially with a lander. We want to understand the composition of Europa's surface materials. What's this dark reddish stuff on the surface? Um, and how does that pertain to potential habitability of its ocean? And geology, we need to understand how Europa's surface features form, including sites of, of recent or current activity, and understand uh, local areas that are of high, high science interest, especially how does water pertain to the formation of Europa's uh, surface features today and in the past. Uh, recent activity cross-cuts really all of these objectives and several years ago observations from the Hubble Space Telescope in the ultraviolet first suggested that there might, uh, well I should say that there were suspicions of plumes at Europa but gave the the best evidence to date that Europa might be active, that there might be places where the interior is venting water to space because we see evidence of oxygen and hydrogen glow in similar locations on the limb of Europa. Very close to the signal to noise limit, um, very hard detection. So we need to understand that it's not some plasma effect, uh, but uh, very well could be that there are plumes at Europa. And that's something we want to test. And if there are plumes, then we can fly through those plumes and sample them like Cassini, this Cassini spacecraft has at Enceladus. Uh, this is the um, suite of 10 Europa Clipper investigations, uh, five in situ and five remote sensing. Let's start with the remote sensing first. Uh, the Europa UVS, that's our ultraviolet spectrograph. And um, Kurt Rutherford, the PI from Southwest Research, uh, looking for plumes at Europa and also characterizing the atmosphere and how it changes over time. ICE is the Europa uh, uh, imaging uh, uh, system. A narrow angle camera and a wide angle camera uh, run out of Applied Physics Lab by Zibby Turtle to map the landscape in color, um, in stereo, uh, at extremely high resolution. We'll go through the details of these. I shouldn't spend so much time here because we're about to see what each of these does. The infrared spectrometer, uh, MISE, uh, Ethemus, the thermal imager, uh, Reason, ice penetrating, radar, and then to the in situ, mass specs, mass spec, uh, uh, neutral gas mass spectrometer, SUDA, a dust analyzer, the Europa Clipper magnetometer I alluded to earlier, PIMS is a set of Faraday cups, a plasma instrument, and we recently added a gravity and radio science team that will use the gravity signal. Um, Doppler signal to probe interior layers of Europa. So I'm going to step through uh, each of these in much more detail. So 
and this will be an opportunity to talk more about the, the science of Europa at the same time. So with the ultraviolet spectrograph, we want to understand um, the um, oxygen emissions to understand the atmosphere of Europa, and we want to uh, search for and characterize any plumes that might be there in much higher resolution than we can do uh, from Earth-based observations. Uh, so at the top is the formal objectives or shorthand for them of uh, the various instruments, and then uh, at the bottom of each slide we'll, you can look at the key parameters if you're curious about the details of how that particular instrument works. Um, so for example, the UV spectrograph can take um, high spatial resolution images when we uh, the trajectory takes us across the scene at close approach or from a distance we'll scan the spacecraft and it can be used to perform occultations to determine atmospheric composition and how that changes uh, where we are in the plasma sheet uh, through time um, etc. Uh, the Europa imaging system is going to be able to map the surface um, most of the surface, uh, over more than 80% at better than 100 meters per pixel. And it has the capability of imaging up to uh, 0.5 to 1 meter per pixel, uh, where, we, um, uh, where we fly by Europa at an altitude of about 50 kilometers. So flybys can get as low as 25 kilometers, uh, altitudes that low challenge. Uh, some of our instruments, but we will be making some very close flybys as well. So I think I mentioned most of these. We'll get a global scale, we'll get a local scale processes uh, through imaging. We'll search for recent activity, complementing the ultraviolet observations, looking for plumes, and also characterizing the albedo and color uh, of the surface to look for surface changes that might relate to recent activity. Uh, both cameras have stereo, uh, have color capability. Um, the WAC gets, the wide angle camera gets stereo as we're flying by, three line stereo of the surface. Uh, when we're in push broom mode, each can do framing or push broom mode. The um, narrow angle camera is gimbaled and can see a total of 60 degrees. So as we're flying by, we can look forward, then down, then back with the gimbal of the camera to get high resolution stereo. And that will be interesting for scientifically to understand the surface at high resolution and mass wasting processes, uh, but also uh, feeds forward to a potential future lander to help characterize uh, sites that we want to explore in the future. The mapping image spectrometer for Europa or MISE, the um, infrared instrument, Diana Blaney, at Jet Propulsion Lab is the principal investigator to look for absor absorption features in the near IR to um, understand what that dark reddish stuff is. Uh, is, it, um, is it acid hydrates? Is it epsomite? Recent suggestion is that it may be uh, sodium chloride on the surface, though that's hard in terms of specific absorptions in the IR. Um, and we want to look for organics. So this is show, the, the first um, uh, rectangle here is showing the uh, 0.8 to, to about uh, 2.5 or 2.8 micron region, the characteristic water ice absorptions and some uh, lab spectra of candidate materials. And the plot here on the right is showing a blowout uh, of um, reflectance up to 0.16, so uh, uh, blowing out just this region down here, because at longer wavelengths, uh, the capability of this instrument out to five microns, the the um, signal, the uh, reflectance is much lower of the materials like organics that we're trying to find. So this is a very high sensitivity instrument that will be able to um, use a scanning mirror sweep across the surface um, and use onboard uh, uh, noise reduction to be able to get a high signal to noise ratio 
and a, and a, and a cryo-cooled uh, detector as well. The Europa Thermal Imaging System, eThemis, uh, Phil Christensen from Arizona State University is a mid-IR spectrometer with just three bands, uh, sufficient to map daytime and nighttime temperatures. And by looking at the, the day-night variation, we can understand the properties of the surface, uh, get out thermal inertia to understand the properties at a sub-pixel scale, and also to look for hot spots, regions that might be glowing warm in the mid-IR in these three bands, um, and perhaps hot enough to, to bleed into the um, uh, near IR and be detected by the MISE instrument. And again, this is something that was done with Cassini at Enceladus to find regions that are active today. And we hope to be able to find analogous regions on Europa. Uh, the radar instrument is the radar for Europa assessment and sounding ocean to near surface or reason. Professor. Uh, yes. Professor, sorry to interrupt. May I ask you what's your current slide? Uh, 13. Has it frozen? Um, is the title radar for Europa assessment and sounding? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry, just to make sure because sometimes yeah, it's a bit slow. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, so the reason instrument is is our radar. The um, the radar antennas we'll see a blow up in in a minute or two. Hang from the solar panels. Uh, we'll be pinging the surface as we fly by to look for reflections from subsurface water bodies and reflection of the signal back to the spacecraft. Uh, and um, we'll be looking for, for indications of subsurface water bodies in the ice shell and uh, potentially the signal passing all the way through the ice shell and reflecting back from a subsurface ocean. We have two frequencies, uh, VHF uh, at um, uh, 60 megahertz, that's five meter wavelength, and a high frequency um, set of antennas, uh, nine megahertz, 33 meter wavelength. So that HF uh, has the potential to penetrate all the way down uh, to liquid water ocean. And even the VHF might be able to do so. In combination, they allow for a range of Europa parameters uh, for us to be robust to, to such a range. So we want to map the distribution of subsurface water, uh, including potential brine, search for ice ocean interface. Um, and it, through, um, through the uh, VHF reflection off the surface, because some portion of the waves will, will reflect off the surface, we can get also at regolith properties. Um, uh, which is a nice um, balance to what the Ethemis uh, mid-IR instrument can get. Okay, now slide 14, mass spectrometer for planetary exploration. We move to the in-situ instruments. Jim Birch is our PI at Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. This is a, um, this is a, Time of flight multi bounce mass spectrometer with uh, really exquisite mass re resolution up to uh, essentially 17,000 over a mass range of 2 to 500 uh, AMU. And um, by bouncing, so, so there's an inlet that allows for um, neutral gases to come in. Those gases uh, uh, are then ionized and sent through the instrument and bounced back and forth uh, up to 40 times to create a very long path length to separate the ions by their time of flight. Um, and so we can look for specific regions of interest at very high resolution uh, over, over a chosen mass range. There's also a cryo trap so that we can trap the atmospheric gases and freeze them in, in the instrument on the cold finger 
until we're far enough from Europa to analyze them where the radiation levels are lower, and so we'll get a better signal to noise farther from Europa. An extremely capable instrument for characterizing the volatiles in Europa's atmosphere, looking for organics and identifying them. Uh, probably our limiting factor will be how clean the spacecraft can be. The surface dust analyzer is SUDA uh, from uh, University of Colorado. Sasha Kempf is the PI uh, to again get at the composition of material knocked off Europa. So I, I mentioned mass specs uh, examining the atmosphere. That can be an atmosphere that's sputtered off of the surface of Europa can also be plumes if they are there. And the same thing for Suda, the particles will be knocked off the surface by micrometeorites, those dust particles, and that's what we want to characterize, or uh, they might originate from plumes. So we want to understand what's coming from Europa, what's coming from outside Europa, for example, from IO, exogenic sources, and uh, identify potential activity uh, such as plumes with this time of flight mass spectrometer. A much, much coarser uh, mass resolution, uh, but, um, but a great complement to the, the mass spectrometer in identifying e either cations or anions on a given flyby to get at the salts and uh, potentially organics at Europa. The, um, actually, let me start with, with magnetometer. I'll come back to the plasma instrument. Uh, uh, Europa Clipper magnetometer I mentioned earlier, Margaret Kivelson is the team leader from the University of Michigan. It will have three flux gate sensors on an eight and a half meter boom to get at the induced magnetic field at Europa at the 11 hour and 85 hour periods, as we discussed earlier, to understand the induction response um, and to get at the ocean thickness and conductivity. And also this can tell us of the ice shell thickness, how thick the non-conductive layer on top of that conductor is to, um, to, to very high um, uh, accuracy and precision. It's a facility instrument pr provided by the Europa Clipper uh, project and we'll use spacecraft rolls to calibrate uh, the instrument in flight. Uh, oops, back to PIMS, the Plasma Instrument for Magnetic Sounding. Joe Westlake at APL is the PI. To understand the magnetic environment with a magnetometer, we need to understand the plasma environment at Europa because that has a strong contribution to the observed magnetic field and it can mask the indu induction response. So we need to model the plasma environment very well with, with measurements that are simultaneous to the um, magnetic measurements. So both instruments will be operating through the whole tour. Uh, it will also measure the characteristics of the ionosphere, possible uh, uh, plume effects, uh, and the magne magnetosphere to characterize compositions and plasma sources. Uh, there are two of these sensors, each with two Faraday cups that have 90 degree fields of view uh, placed in different parts of the spacecraft to see as best as possible uh, the entire uh, uh, four pi steradians. And the instruments will measure ion density, temperature, velocity, and electron density and temperature. Um, and then last but not least, gravity and radio science. Erwin Mazariko of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center uh, was relatively recently uh, chosen as the team leader and uh, a team of gravity radio scientists chosen as well to characterize the time varying gravitational tides at Europa to confirm the existence of a subsurface ocean. Galileo made 12 flybys uh, with uh, Europa Clipper will make about 50. And so we'll be able to encounter Europa at different places in its eccentric orbit. And in that way, um, understand how that gravitational field is varying as Europa um, uh, as Europa's tides move across the surface. And um, we'll be able to make measurements simultaneously with the other instruments because there are three fan beam antennas and two low gain antennas. We won't be using the high gain antenna for this. It'll be pointed the wrong way during a flyby. We'll use the fan beams and the low gain antennas uh, and using uh, X-band 
up and down, and, and of course uh, the DSN for radio receivers. Um, and this plot is just re is representing how many antennas uh, are necessary, how much collection area is necessary to achieve link uh, with the ground uh, within plus or minus two hours of closest approach for, in this model, a, a, a flyby set of 46 flybys from Verma and, and Margot uh, several years ago. So a little more on the flight system. Let's see it all together here. The remote sensing instruments are designed to be nadir pointed during a flyby. So they're all looking down at Europa surface or from afar. And the um, mass spectrometer, the neutral gas mass spectrometer and the dust detector are in the ram direction. So as you fly by the top of my head, the ram direction, and I'm looking down, we're flying that way. As I mentioned, the fan beam antennas and low gain antennas are placed around the spacecraft so that most of the time we have a lock on on Earth during a flyby for gravity. And you can see this solar rays which articulate uh, about 100 square meters in area. Uh, on them are suspended the HF and VHF radar antennas. On the right, you see a representative trajectory. The final one, of course, hasn't been chosen. Uh, we come in with a couple of um, uh, highly elliptical orbits to start with. The color coding is showing the radiation, the total ionizing dose increasing through the tour to ultimately up to about three megarads, which is our design point. We will first, if the sun is toward the top here, we'll first encounter Europa on um, the outside of its orbit um, and encounter the anti-Jovian hemisphere of Europa to cover it sunlit. And then using other satellites, crank the orbit around to start encountering Europa uh, on the sub-Jovian hemisphere coming on the inside of Europa's orbit to see the sub-Jovian hemisphere lit. So first the anti-Jovian, then the sub-Jovian in order to encounter uh, both major hemispheres of Europa. That's a very clever mission design. Um, actually, I'll skip this one for the moment because it leads well into this one. Th uh, this rotating movie on the bottom left here is showing, again, representative trajectory color coded by altitude. So where you see red, we're getting down to between 25 and 50 kilometers off the surface and orange 50 to 100 kilometers. And the green is 100 to 400 kilometers, the white up to 1,000 kilometers. There goes Jupiter in the background. So that's the subjovian. You're looking down at the anti-jovian hemisphere here to see this web of flybys. Uh, all the closest approaches are on the sub and anti-Jovian hemispheres because we need to be, um, uh, that needs to be the tangent to the, uh, uh, to the surface as we make a flyby, there, otherwise you'd be crashing into Europa. So the leading and trailing points uh, won't have close approaches, but we can see them from afar as we're approaching and as we're departing from higher altitude. And so that narrow angle camera will be invaluable in mapping Europa's surface, uh, even in places that we're not flying by very close. On the right are example coverages with the warmer colors being higher resolutions for the five, well, for reason showing ground tracks and crossovers, and then the resolutions implied by the, uh, the other four remote sensing instruments. So, so back to the previous. This is a fun little movie. It'll take just a few minutes here um, to show a typical Europa flyby illustrated. This is a still frame from it, so I can explain a bit. Uh, you'll see the fields of view of the various instruments. The narrow angle camera, as I mentioned, is on a gimbal, but in this animation, it'll just be showing uh, uh, the view toward Nader. Um, only the narrow angle camera has a gimbal and the uh, infrared spectrometer can scan on one axis. So 
you'll see early in the movie when we're far away, uh, uh, before we're, we're fixed Nader, that we do some scans for the ultraviolet instrument and for Ethemus, the uh, mid-IR instrument, so we can scan across Europa and the narrow angle camera and, and MISE, the near IR, can take advantage of those scans as well from afar. In the bottom right, you'll see a plot of where Europa is, the white uh, uh, ellipse, and where Europa Clipper is, the, the blue ellipse and its dot. And we are mostly, at least currently, planning flybys that have a four to one resonance with Europa. Every time Europa goes around four times, then we make an encounter, at least uh, typically. We're looking at the option of six to one as well, which will take a little longer per, um, per flyby to achieve. And then in the bottom left, you'll see which instruments are on by which get a uh, grade, uh, according to their acronyms here. And how the spacecraft is oriented um, is shown at top, though that's a little complicated to follow. And, and some of the details are, are also on the top left on altitude, relative speed, and the like. OK, so I'll narrate a little bit uh, here as we uh, have just finished transmitting some data, it's probably some last data to Earth. And note the solar panels were charging in an optimal position. We flip around the spacecraft to put Nader toward Europa to be able to do some of these ultraviolet scans. And at the same time, we want to keep those solar panels uh, as, as sun-pointed as feasible. That was calibration, the Themis, some narrow angle camera frames. And we roll around now to put the RAM direction uh, in the right direction. So we're Nader RAM optimized, as it says up top. This is that scan that we call the joint scan with three or four instruments operating at once. After that joint scan, we stay fixed with uh, Europa below us in the, in the Nader position. And as we approach, uh, we will rotate the solar panels to put the radar instrument into its proper orientation. So we're no longer optimized for charging, but now we're optimized for the flyby and on batteries as we zoom by Europa with all of the instruments on together. And then as we pull away, we do the same thing um, in reverse order. So the goal is to simplify operations by planning simple repetitive observations uh, through the mission. And we'll see that joint scan once again as we pull away, the sun is now more toward the top of the view here. There's that joint scan. And the spacecraft will ready itself for transmission of data back to Earth. So that's what we do about 50 times or so. And there it goes back to the optimized charging position. And the uh, magnetometer and the plasma instrument are there all the time. Oh, sorry, the acronym for the magnetometer was the older acronym. Um, and then just to wrap up here, uh, it's been so incredible to see, even though remotely see photos of the hardware coming along after so many years of working to get this mission uh, going. Uh, we mentioned the Galileo days, and um, back then we were pondering what kind of mission to Europa might be the appropriate follow up <clears throat> to the Galileo mission. Uh, I joined my first science definition team in 1998 to work toward the Europa mission. When I went to JPL, I told myself, well, I'll go there for a few years. If a Europa mission doesn't start happening, then I'll go back to academia. And it was nine years uh, before the Europa mission did get uh, a go-ahead from NASA. <clears throat> so now here we are with the flight model of the um, calcium fluoride lens that's going to be in the infrared spectrometer, the flight model of the, the plasma instruments collector assembly, the flight model of the flux gate, one of the three flux gate inner assemblies uh, from UCLA. Uh, there's the housing for the ultraviolet spectrograph coming together, the engineering model of the SUDA instrument in its dust chamber at 
Colorado. The engineering model for the mass specs, mass spectrometer. The engineering model for the narrow angle camera and the prototype for the wide angle camera. Uh, this is the um, a prototype of deployment for the Reason HF antenna, which are 16 meters long in total, eight meters each direction, and prototype for deployment of the VHF antennas. There won't be a person there. There'll be a pin uh, <laughs> that pulls out instead. Uh, oops, next, there we go. And some amazing progress on the flight system. The Nader deck uh, getting its bite pods attached, the high gain antenna reflector being completed, the propulsion module cylinders, upper and lower, uh, being stacked here in a test configuration to make sure they fit properly. And on the right is showing the oxidizer tank being lowered in. It's a fisheye lens. It really did fit uh, in there. Um, and we have proof of that now because this image was released uh, just this past week showing the upper and lower si uh, cylinders, propulsion module cylinders now permanently assembled with the oxidizer tank in there. This is at Goddard uh, being supervised by uh, APL, Applied Physics Lab. Uh, it will be shipped to APL before too long and then sent over to JPL for integration uh, with the instruments. So this is an effort of an enormous team. Uh, there are 130 of the uh, project science group, the science team, and many, but not nearly all, of the engineers working on the team are part of the picture at bottom, which also includes our mascot, the monolith from 2001, which has made an appearance uh, at each of our 10 now, uh, sorry, nine now uh, project science group, uh, uh, science team meetings. The, uh, the last appearance had to be a virtual one. There's our website. If you want to know more information, it's uh, growing all the time, europa.nasa.gov. And uh, there's also one at, at housed at nasa, nasa.gov slash Europa Clipper. I'd be happy to take questions in the time available and thank you all for your attention and for being here. Many, many thanks for Professor Papalardo. Yeah, great. Do we have any questions? No. We do, we do. I see also a reaction here in this chat from John Algin, very awesome. And then the first question that maybe you can also see in the chat box in case that is more convenient. It says, thanks for a very interesting talk. You said that the whole surface of Europa met around 60 million years ago. Do we know the cause of this phenomenon? Well, we don't know if there was a single event or if Europa is in steady state resurfacing and resurfaces in patches over here and then over there. It's analogous to the problem of understanding Venus resurfacing. Uh, does it resurface all at once from some global event or is it always active a little bit at a time? Uh, the, evidence, the geological evidence suggests a change in style from making ridged planes to making chaos. Chaos is the more recent uh, uh, material in general. And even the character of the ridges and grooves changes in the stratigraphy. So that suggests, a, so a change in style suggests that maybe something did happen 60 or 100 million years ago, and then the average age is 60 million years old. And it could be that Europa's orbital eccentricity was uh, kicked up. Europa being in, in resonance with Ganymede and with Io, Io will actually tend to uh, pull Europa along. Io is predicted to have orbital eccentricity changes on a time scale of about 100 million years. So it may force Europa's orbital eccentricity to change on a similar time scale. So, so that's a popular model uh, that might explain 
uh, fluctuating activity level uh, and um, maybe not melting, but greater geologic activity sometime in the past 100 million years. Thank you very much. Next question is, is there any plans for incorporating, incorporating citizen science to look at data from this mission, much like what was done with Mars? Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we're open to ideas and we're still developing the plans, uh, but I'd certainly like to see some aspect of citizen science. So we'll see what, what, um, what the science communications team uh, is able to come up with. But um, certainly one thing that's been done in the past is asking the public to look like with New Horizons when it passed by uh, Jupiter was to ask uh, the public what, what times, what places uh, might make for interesting photographs that we maybe haven't planned for. So that's one idea, but um, it's not formalized yet. Thank you. Next question. Will there be a lander or rover to Europa to examine the surface, surface material? There have been studies of landers, uh, first to see whether we could incorporate one onto this mission, but it would take a lot more mass and a lot more money. Uh, so uh, a follow-up lander has been looked at in some detail uh, by a group led out of JPL. And that concept is now being considered by the Planetary Decadal Survey uh, in the United States. So we will see where that comes out in terms of the rankings of future mission priorities. I sure hope that we get to see a lander in our lifetimes. Thank you. Then we have a question about the Jewish mission of the European Space Agency. Is there any plan for Europa Clipper to work with that mission? We have been, so So my, myself and two deputies on the mission, Dave Sensky of JPL and Haya Korth of APL, have been meeting uh, approximately monthly with the JUICE uh, project scientist, Olivier uh, Vitas, and we have had to date, I think it's three workshops with the science teams, not not the whole team, but portions of each uh, meeting at, at conferences and finding some time to talk about what kind of science can be done uh, if we have both spacecraft in the Jupiter system at the same time. And uh, a really exciting example is magnetospheric science having two spacecraft, if you have one uh, juice in orbit around Ganymede, measuring the Ganymede magnetic field and the Europa Clipper measuring the Jovian field at the same time, we can really start to get an idea of the cause and effect um, of, um, of processes in the magnetosphere. I like to think of the magnetosphere as, as a, an ocean or a sea. And so if you see a wave coming over here, then you know it's going to hit over here. And, um, and so you, you want two, you want multiple buoys um, mapping out the effects in that magnetospheric ocean. Uh, but um, the complementary science, the potential for complementary science is great. We have similar ultraviolet uh, spectrographs on the two missions that could be uh, examining uh, similar or the same phenomena from two different uh, vantage points. Uh, so for example, if there are plumes at Europa. These have all been informal conversations, so we'll see what emerges over the next decade or so, but, but I expect we'll have good cooperation between the two. Thank you. Then we have also a question about comet and asteroid. Uh, would comet and asteroid impact impacts contribute to the presence of organic material on Europa's surface? Yeah, it definitely, they definitely should. Uh, should um, so at Ganymede and Callisto, there is good geologic evidence that their dark material was delivered by impactors early in solar system history. So we know that there is organic material in asteroids, in comets. And so, so Europa too must have had a delivery of all this organic material, the same kind of thing we see in the dark train at Ganymede and all over Callisto. But for Europa, it's been resurfaced 
in various ways. And so that organic material must have been dumped into Europa's ocean or and interior. And still today, when there is an impact, even though they're rarer and smaller, there is delivery of some organic material. So yes, we know there must be some, but organics are also destroyed by radiation. So if, if they're enveloped in Europa, okay, the organics are there. If they're sitting on the surface, they can be degraded and uh, sputtered away. Thank you. And finally, so far, I think the last question is, how dangerous is the energetic charged particle environment near Europa's orbit? Well, if a person were there and could tolerate the, um, the cold um, in a spacesuit, uh, well, okay, if a person were there without a spacesuit and could tolerate the cold, uh, you'd be killed by the radiation in, I think it was something like eight hours, um, oh, eight minutes to eight hours. Yeah, I did that calculation once, uh, a lethal dose will be obtained depending on where one is on Europa's surface because the the, the um, flux varies across the surface. So that radiation is also damaging to spacecraft parts. The Europa mission has to be uh, include parts that are radiation tolerant. Uh, it's uh, most sensitive electronics will be in a vault uh, down deep in the spacecraft. And we know that the solar rays will degrade over time uh, in response to radiation, and therefore the power will reduce over time uh, for the mission. So the radiation is damaging, uh, but ironically, that same radiation in hitting Europa's surface generates oxidants that might be able to fuel life down there below the surface. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see, I think there is no other question, so I think time is up. And therefore, I would like to thank you once again. It's 10 p.m. Uh, for you, so uh, don't want to, don't want to, um, I think it's time, yes, to, to, to finish the webinar now. I just want to remind everyone that um, our next webinar of the On Things To Come uh, series will be on the 19th of May with uh, Sam Kruke from the European Space Agency, and it will be the second webinar on the Solar Orbiter mission. So it's gonna be also in that case a, a little series and there will be a third one. Many thanks once again, and the recording will be up uh, either today or tomorrow. Thank you, and have Thank a good you, night. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. And, Thank you uh, so much. Evening. <laughs> Thank you. And lots Thank of you. Love. Thank you.